What's good everybody, season three, LCL. In this episode, we're gonna get into the backstory of one of the most renowned, legendary, diverse artists in the game right now, Sean Tell Martin. And she's literally changing the game. I mean, she's in museums all over the world, including the MoMA, the Brooklyn Art Museum. She's working with brands like Lexus. She's working with brands like Samsung. She just did a collaboration also with Kendrick Lamar, Alicia Keys. I mean, she's literally on such a trajectory and it's unbelievable. But we're gonna get into the backstory. We're gonna get into how she grew, grew up in East London, similar to where the Clockwork Orange stemmed from, and how she was really succumbed to this environment that taught her that she can't become an artist, that really, you know, she never would really consider taking her passion for drawing to becoming something that she can pursue for the rest of her life, and how that really affected her. She used to have to hide drawing under her bed or behind the curtains in her bedroom, but you know what, she overcame all of that. And we're gonna get into her story and how she left to Japan, then to New York City, traveling the world and becoming one of the most sought after, most unbelievable artists for this generation, and definitely gonna become legendary. What made you, because I know I read that you would even draw underneath your bed, <laughs> you would, you know, go behind your window curtains and draw, I mean, what were you thinking at that yeah. time? In, in well, I did that because I got in trouble for drawing. Right. I, was, I was that kid that drew all my friends, got in trouble, drew all my, you know, my uh, books at school, got in trouble, drew all my clothes, got in trouble, drew all my bedroom walls, got in trouble. So it got to the point where... I, I had to draw, so I had to hide it, and I would go under my bed and draw under my bed, or draw behind my curtains, or draw in these places where I could just get it out, but no one would see it, and then I wouldn't get in trouble for doing it. So it was something I actually hid for a while, because I did it so compulsively that it was an issue, because yeah. teachers were like, Chantelle's not focusing, she's not concentrating, she's doodling in her book. Right, right. Um, not that, wait, there's something there, this child is doing something that maybe there's something there that we should encourage it, it's the opposite you know they they try and restrict it or stop it and so i i had to go and hide and, and still do it it's interesting to think i talk about education and like the whole process of it today and how i do feel like it somewhat puts you into a box you know yeah and but we have this school system that eventually teaches people that they can do something or they can't do something and typically if i'm giving a talk to a bunch of adults i love to ask the question can you draw and if you can draw, put your hand up. And typically, even in a creative room, you'll probably only get 30% of people putting their hand up. And then I say, well, for everyone else, how can you not do something as an adult that you could do as a two-year-old, a three-year-old, a four-year-old, a five-year-old, a six-year-old, maybe even a seven, eight, nine-year-old? <laughs> of course you can draw, but somewhere along the way, you learn that you can't and they can. And you learn that from the teachers, you learn that from the parents, you learn that from your peers. And, you, you know, with me, it was something where I believed that I could and I kept doing it. But it's not to say later on I, 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 um, I wasn't always that way. You know, later on I thought, well, so many people can draw much better than me. Why should I even continue? So we always have these like blockages or these roads or these challenges that we have to overcome. You talk about this consciousness of the way that you draw. I was asking you earlier, like, is it conscious? Is it subconscious? You know, because you're kind of like freeing your mind and you had mentioned to me that it's like it's somewhat bold. Yeah. And can you talk to me a little more about like... Yeah, and I, you know, people always, they, they describe my work as a stream of, 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 of consciousness or subconsciousness. And, and like I said, it, it's both. So, so when I'm drawing, you know, it's, it's like meditation. You're, you're highly aware and focused, but at the same time, you're taking a back seat to what you're doing. You're, you're getting into this position where you just allow things to happen. You allow things to flow because you can't really tell the pen where to go because then it doesn't work. Because what I'm doing is I'm drawing with intention. And for example, if you have a 200 foot wall and you're not planning what you're gonna do, you're just allowing the pen to go where it wants to go. 
For it to work, you have to draw with good intention. For it to work, you have to take a back seat. For it to work, you just have to almost just dance with the pen and allow it to dance and, and be free and go where it wants to. Because if at any time you try and force it, it doesn't work. If at any time uh, you try and be someone else, it doesn't work. If at any time you try and hesitate and you're scared about what you're doing, it doesn't work. So you, you approach it in this very confident, uh, aware, focused state, but at the same time, you're, you're saying, okay, just you'll be what you're gonna be. Yeah. How does that correlate to not just art, but the way that us, uh, you know, as just human beings, as people should really live our lives? Yeah. And so how should we live our lives? I don't draw to be a better person. I try and be a better person so that what I love comes out in the way that it should come out, as it does in the form of drawing. And I wake up every day and I'm like, well, how can I try and have more of an open heart? How can I try and be less angry? How can I be more confident? How can I be more respectful? How can I, how can I um, regret less? How can I eat better? How can I drink better? How can I think better? How can I do all these things that potentially might make me a better person? How can I be that person that picks up litter from the street? How can I be this, you know, this person that sacrifices? And, and the more you focus on that, um, it, Jesus, just even a little bit every day, the more you're gonna wake up and do what you love by default. For me, it's like creating, it's drawing, it's collaborating, it's being myself, it's questioning, it's, um, it's being an adventurer within the realm of creativity that you're exploring. So what's the point in making art? The point is to make so you can share. So you make and share and you make and share and you make and share. I'm Chantal Martin and I draw. I'm drawing on canvases, I'm drawing on walls, I'm drawing on cars, I'm drawing on shirts, I'm drawing on shoes. 99% of that is done live. When you're drawing live, you have no time to think, you have no time to hesitate, you have no time to plan, you have no time to be anyone else. What made you go from where you were growing up to move to Japan. Let's back up there for a yeah. second because that I remember that, that part of your story of like that's when you started really diving into this live performing art. Can you talk to me a little yeah. bit more about that experience? You know, you're in Japan one year, you have no idea what you're eating, you can't speak to anyone, you, you don't understand anything. And then after a year, you kind of know what you're eating and you can speak a little bit. And after two years, you know, you, you need to practice what you learn. And after three years, you're speaking a little bit and you're making friends and uh, it just continues like that. But one thing um, I really got into in Japan is going out to clubs. You know, Japan uh, culturally has a huge expectation for visuals and a really high standard of production. And you go to these mega clubs and you have these giant screens and projections and, mm -hmm. you know, the best quality DJs and music. And, and so I love cool. going out and I was in my 20s, so go out and dance. Uh, but clubs there are also really expensive. So I thought, well, how can I get into clubs without paying? Because I can't afford to club. I can't afford to go out <laughs> dancing three or four times a week. Uh, and I was like, well, I can draw. And in Japan, there's a huge VJ scene, a huge visual jockeying scene. Typically, it's like guys coming in with a couple computers, mixing these clips, you know, there's someone running, there's a tunnel, there's a rabbit. And I was like, wow, like, it's cool, but it's so background. Like, what if I can come in and I draw and um, make it more relevant? So I started to get in as a VJ and started to, to draw at these mega clubs. and. You know, I have my computer, a drawing tablet, and I'd open up some simple drawing software. But what I could do is I could draw to the beat. You know, the DJ's playing, it's minimal techno music, the crowd start going woo, and then I would write woo, and I'd zoom in, zoom out, move that around, bring some colors in, you see your friend, you write their name. And, and the visuals suddenly became relevant. They became foreground, they became uh, real time. And yeah, people present. Could, yeah, present. And people would be like, wow, like this is happening now. And I got really addicted to that. And I got addicted to being in this space where you don't have time to think, you don't have time to hesitate, you don't have time to plan, you don't have time to be anyone else because you want to keep the visuals on the screen moving. You want to keep the lines and the words and the characters on the screen evolving and changing. So you can't think about what you're doing. You just have to do it. So I spent hours and hours and hours in clubs just drawing and, and letting the lines keep moving. And it really kind of was like the backbone of of the style that I have now and, and of the technique that I have now and, and kind of this, this idea of it being a performance. The biggest thing about collaborating is completely removing your ego. 
when you remove your ego, you allow yourself to open different chapters that you may not know about, that the person next to you may know about. We're able to do this as artists. We're able to meet other talented people who are as obsessed about what they do as we are and meet in the middle somewhere and create something new. You're in my head and I'm in your head at the same time. It's dope. The location has an effect on my art. The audience has an effect on my art. The space is as relevant to the art as the art is to the space. Being on stage performing, you see things. You see color, you see, you see sounds, you're seeing the words reflect off other words. Her art has layers, and when you break my music down, it has layers. So it's a great hand-in-hand -hand experience. After finding her style in Japan, she decided to go to New York City, and this is where she really challenged herself and asked the question, who are you? We're gonna get into really how she figured out who she was and how you should be asking that same question about yourself. You know, you have this question that I, you ask the people around you um, of like, who are you? Wh why do you ask that question? I asked that question and I started to ask that question when I moved to New York from Japan. So I, I had this very nice career in Japan. I lived there for almost five years and I moved to New York and I found out that if people don't know who you are, they don't care who you are. And everyone's an artist. And, and the career that I had in Japan didn't exist in New York. So I got to New York and people would be like, oh, you should try this or you should do this or look at this person and look at that person. And I started to get completely lost because you start to listen to people and think, oh, maybe I should do this or maybe I should be like this person. Maybe I should think like this person. And it just really helped me to write out this phrase, who are you, 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 multiple times. And just the practice of that and then sticking it up on my door. So every day before I left my bedroom, where, wherever I was living at that time, before I left my bedroom, before I left the house, I've seen this question of who are you? And then I realized that, wow, like who are you is this big kind of crazy daunting question. It's about identity, it's about path, it's about yeah. many, many things. But what if we just subtract it a little bit and we look at the first three letters, which are W, A, Y, way. So now I open my bedroom door, now I leave my house and I'm thinking about, Chantel, how are you finding your way in life? How are you finding your way today? And I was like, okay, I'm gonna find my way through this language of words and lines and drawing and connecting and experiencing. And I think when we twist it from, you know, who are you, this big crazy question to the simple, simplifying it, how am I gonna find my way today? And then the, the more I thought about it, I was like, well, way kind of needs a de destination. And I came up with, you know, the, the, or it's a phrase that's been around for a long time, but you are you. And the first three letters of that are W, you know, Y, A, Y, which are yay. Yeah. So it's very simply like this path of way to yay. I'm finding my way to yay. It's kind of cheesy, but when you get to yay, you're like, wow, I'm in this place of celebration. I know what I'm doing. I know who I am. But now I realize I have so much more to learn and so much more growing to do and so much more figuring things out that I have to start asking that original question or asking that original way in a new way. And then that's where this phrase of are you you came around. It was that evolution or that cycle of the original question of who are you. And it's something that helps me every day. It still helps me. It's, it's almost like a little seed. And you know, I'll hand out these stickers of who are you or you are you and are you you. And people put them up, they put them on their phones, their computers or on their doors. And, and I think it's, it's something really good just to consciously or unconsciously see that question in the day and, and ask yourself, am I being myself? Am I on the right path? Am I being true? Am I finding my way? How is my way? What is the destination? Just give me a pen and I'll make something. <laughs> to go wherever it wants to take you. You are a willing passenger. And now you repeat that and you repeat that and you repeat that and you repeat that. But over time you get to extract what you look like. Over time you get to extract what your line feels like. Something that is recognizably yours. 
We have this contact between our head and our hand. And it doesn't matter what industry you're in, it comes down to drawing, it comes down to that initial mark that you make. And without this pen, I wouldn't have traveled, I wouldn't have collaborated. This tool has allowed me to discover who I am. Goodbye. So as an entrepreneur, I feel like we're all artists in our own ways, right? So I'm gonna talk to Chantel about, you know, is everyone an artist? And at the end of the day, for the people that are really pursuing art as a career, how to think about it as a business. Because there's this, there's this cliche thought, you know, of like artists being this like glamour dream and people are just painting. You don't realize the hard work that goes into it and how you really need to be thinking like a businessman or woman, even as an artist, and how Chantel is challenging that status quo. I came to New York for all those cliche reasons, the, the energy, the people, the opportunities, and then I realized that I was waiting for people to give me opportunities. You know, I was playing that if game. Right. If I had money, if I had a studio, if I had a mentor, if I had this, if I had that, then I could do this and I could do that and then I could do that. And I wasn't playing that game where it's like, well, what do I have? Okay. Uh, what do I have access to? How do I create my own opportunities? And when I started to think that way, I started to ask friends if I could use their space or I started to just, like I said, draw more on everything. Yeah. And the, the, the thing about in New York is if you just go out there and do it, you're already like in this top 10, 20% of artists because most artists just talk about doing stuff. They don't actually do it. <laughs> so if you go out there and you start making things, you're already up there. And then if you start making things and sharing things, People in New York love to talk about things that are cool. So the more that you do it, the more that they talk about it. And then eventually a museum calls you like MoMA and they say, hey, we have this friends and family event and we'd love you to do your giant projections. Can you do that? Wow. Do you believe that everyone has, is an artist? Yeah, you know, I think everyone is creative. Everyone is an artist. Um, it almost seems like a bit of a silly question. Like, yeah, of course. Because <laughs> we are, you just look at us as kids again. Yeah. You know, what do we do as kids? We're, we create, we make, we share, uh, we experiment. Um, it doesn't stop, you know. But, but I feel like there's so many people that I, that I think get caught up into, like, this work and hustle life. Yeah. And they don't really, you know, remember that, of what it feels like to be a kid again. And maybe whether it's drawing or it's riding a bike or yeah. it's you know going and playing you know going out and playing a sport or you know dancing you know yeah. whatever it is like people don't really do that enough or you know I don't know why that is and I feel like the world needs more of that though yeah I think you know there's there's a couple things that play there's play and there's work and um you know to be an artist it's really playful but it also takes a lot of work yeah and it takes a lot of practice and I think what we miss out on is that people don't really share their process and people don't share their practice. So then we have this kind of imaginary or romantic image of an artist or a musician or Very a professional true. something. And we have this image that they, they go away and they're these, you know, these archetype of people and they have this craze or this romantic fit and then they produce this work. Mm -hmm. And it's like, no, no artist ever. You know, behind, you peel that back and behind there is hard work, it's practice. It's uh, the artists really scrutinizing their process and, and then, you know, pushing themselves. And, and I think the more that we as artists share our process and share the work versus hiding away and then bringing it out to yeah. the public, the more that we share that, the more that the public will be like, oh, it takes hard work. Right. Oh, it takes practice. Oh, it takes grit. Oh, it takes these things. Oh, it takes passion because now oh, it we're took all these years and it too. takes these years. And, and um, I think we just need to share that and, and um, expose that so that people don't think, oh, well, I can't do that. He's like, you can do it. You just have to put these things into it. Yeah. And I, I as an I, I feel like as an entrepreneur, like I'm an artist in my own way, you know, in the way that I create, you know, and, and take these ideas and these things that I'm passionate about and love and and then and try. Yeah. And try to bring them to the world, you know, and to solve, a, you know, to solve a problem and to bring something that makes me happy at the end of the day. And I think that will help bring something to, the, to other people that similarly may be facing that problem or looking for that type of solution. So I feel like we're all artists in our own ways. But as an entrepreneur, I do feel like I'm consistently having to think about the business end too, right? And like, I love to create, you know, create, create a product 
um, or a technology or a service or things, but I'm like, I gotta think about also, how am I gonna, how am I gonna sustain yeah. this? As an artist, when did you realize, you know, the, how, how are you gonna sustain this? Or, or did you ever think about it a biz, a, yeah. is, as a business? But that's the thing, that, that, this is the issue, right? Because we don't think as artists as business people. Right. And that's why we don't set them, set them up to succeed. Yeah. Artists do need to know about commerce. Artists do need to know about contracts. Artists do need lawyers. Artists do need five-year plans. Artists do need advisors. And, and for the most part, artists, including myself, we learn the hard way because right. artists, we probably get taken more advantage of than any other people. And, and even at this point, most projects I, get take, uh, I do, someone is still trying to take something or be out of the scope of the budget or you know, take, think that they can claim the art for free or something like that. Right. And it's just like, no, we are business people. Right. We are entrepreneurs. Uh, we should be equipped in the same way that we imagine that we're equipping you. Right. And because we don't do that, we set artists up to fail. And I, I, and I think we really need to just educate people or um, kind of um, reassess the situation in how we see artists and how we support them. So I love this episode. I love Chantelle's work. I really believe that she's one of the greatest artists of our generation. Remember what she said. At the end of the day, you can take all the opinions, you can look for inspiration all around you, even this video, but at the end of the day, you have to find that inspiration inside of yourself. Know that it's gonna take time. It's gonna take patience. And don't be afraid to share your work. Put your work out there. You know, you really need to get out there and really create your own opportunities. So Chantel, thank you for sharing your story. Guys, who are you? Comment below, engage with us. It's season three, on to the next one. It's your boy GA. Peace. New merch alert. I'm excited to announce that we are finally releasing our Leaders Create Leaders merchandise. All you have to do is head to the link in our description below and make sure to get it now because they're all in limited quantities. I want to repost you guys, so make sure if you're joining the squad, the hashtag LCL squad so I can find you and post you up.